this is the Barasovka mammoth, as he was found back in 1902, I believe was the year, and and um, cro- cropping out from a collapsed, uh, some collapsed permafrost. You see this cliff here collapsed uh, onto, and and then revealed this guy sitting here, basically. So picture he's buried under here, and then the 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 soil falls away and 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 reveals him sitting here right and what you're looking here at is the skull and this is the left forelimb right here wow so this is basically how he was found and you can see here the the forelimb here yep is here and then here's his back foot whoops what you see let's see can we see that yeah you see part of it right here this next one is a better photograph. You see the back leg here, oh, yes, the front yes. forelimb, the skull, right. Wow. So, and see, he was found on his haunches like this. And as I explained, his hip bones were broken as if he was slammed back onto his haunches with great force. So some of the interesting circumstances uh, surrounding this guy, which, uh, we'll look at right here, okay? He weighed approximately six tons. The contents of the stomach were not putrefied, so the carcass must have frozen completely in 10 hours or less to prevent putrefaction. Flowering plants among the stomach contents indicate some fairly mild climate, perhaps autumn, fairly high temperature at the time of death, approximately 50 degrees Fahrenheit or more. The temperature required to freeze the six-ton mammoth in less than 10 hours is approximately 100 to 150 degrees below zero. Had to have remained com- completely frozen from the time of death to the time of exhumation. Mammoth sitting on haunches, both hip bones broken, indicating that the animal must have been thrown back violently. Burial must have been instantaneous to prevent decay of carcass. Erect penis indicates rapid suffocate, suffocation under pressure. So interesting circumstances that don't fit the, the gradualist paradigm and are completely inconsistent with death by human predation. And there have been many examples. This is, uh, uh, was it Dima, the name of this baby woolly mammoth that was found mm-hmm. mummified in the permafrost? This was a great article that came out back in 1962, back in the heyday of strict gradualism. And it was an independent researcher by the name of Harold E. Lippman published this in, in the journal Science about the finding of these repeated findings of frozen mammoths. In an earlier issue of Science, paleontologist William R. Farrand made a valiant attempt to salvage the gradualistic position vis-a-vis the frozen mammoth. Mammoths, but these fossils of the Siberian permafrost present an insuperable difficulty for a theory of slow, gradual geology. Baron Cuvier, one of the most critical observers of these remains, insisted that they were frozen suddenly. He wrote, it is well known that its tusks are still so well preserved in cold countries that they are used for the same purpose as new ivory. And as we have before remarked, individuals have been found with the flesh, skin, and hair, which had been frozen since the final catastrophe of the globe. And then William R. Ferrand, who was a strict gradualist, responded to this by this comment right here. It is not logically sound to postulate a major catastrophe on a scale far beyond anything we have experienced to explain geological phenomena, which can be adequately explained by the everyday processes which we can observe around us. So I like that. So it is it is not logically sound to postulate anything beyond what we've experienced, you know. (laughs) Right. Is it really? Or is it not logically sound to assume that everything that's happened in the history of the earth is just comparable to what we've observed in the last two centuries. That the last two centuries is representative. See, what what is really more logically sound here? (laughs) Yeah, so we've got some interesting, these are just typical of the kinds of finds that occur over and over and over again. This was like from an old journal, circa 1929. Skulls of mammoth, super bison, and American lion found during placer 
mining operations in Alaska. Here's remains of an extinct bison found in frozen muck near Fairbanks, Alaska. And here is one of my favorite guys of all who has written about the uh, terminal place to see an extinction. This is uh, Dr. Frank C. Hibben. He was an anthropologist, naturalist, and outdoorsman. And he was one who actually went and followed the placer mining operations, um, which are excavate using these high pressure hydraulic hoses to blast away the um, the permafrost. Yeah. So yeah, here this is this is an example of muck. What the, mm -hmm, the muck, the frozen yeah. muck. To muck get to the, yeah. To, exactly. To get to the to the uh, gold deposits, right? So he he went along with these guys to see what kind of stuff they were uncovering as they're blasting away at this frozen permafrost. Now there's been an effort to discredit Hibben again by the same crowd that wants yeah. to bury the whole idea of catastrophic extinction, right? Now in, uh, in Magicians of the Gods, Graham Hancock does a great job of debunking the debunkers, debunking the detractors of Frank C. Hibben and how they, manipulated basically tried to you know um attack him he of course he's he's gone now but you know to basically to smear his reputation in order to discredit what he discovered and reported on and and um we're gonna right now we're gonna we're gonna end with that um tonight i'm gonna just quote a little bit from frank c hibben's work the lost americans and this is what the, the gradualists and the proponents of human-caused predation have attacked because this is completely, again, his, his eyewitness testimony is completely inconsistent with the, with the gradualist paradigm. And again, like I said, there have been, if you go online, you'll find several attempts to discredit Hibben. And again, Graham Hancock does a great job of addressing those attempts to discredit Hibben and his and his observations and his reporting on those observations. And here's a sample of, of what he says. The Pleistocene period ended in death. This was no ordinary extinction of a vague geological period which fizzled to an uncertain end. This death was catastrophic and all-inclusive. The large animals that had given the name to the period became extinct. Their death marked the end of the era. But how did they die? What caused the extinction of 40 million animals? In this particular case, and now again, he's reporting from what he has witnessed himself from these plaster mining observations. In this particular case, the death was of such colossal proportions as to be staggering to contemplate. Who or what killed the Pleistocene animals is a query that has not yet been answered. The corpus delecti of the deceased in this mystery may be found almost anywhere. Their bones lie bleaching in the sands of Florida and in the gravels of New Jersey. They weather out of the dry terraces of Texas and protrude from the sticky ooze of the tar pits of Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. Thousands of these remains have been encountered in Mexico and even in South America. The bodies lie as articulated skeletons revealed by dust storms or as isolated bones and fragments in ditches or canals. The bodies of the victims are everywhere in evidence. In spite of the indications that a few animals escaped the tragedy, there is no doubt that the major portion of the great animals of the Pleistocene met their end at the same time. And it might appear at first that many of these great animals died natural deaths. That is, that the remains that we find in the Pleistocene strata over the continent represent the normal death that ends the ordinary life cycle. However, where we can study these animals in such detail, such as in the great bone deposits of Nebraska, we find literally thousands of these remains together. 
The young lie with the old, foal with dam and calf with cow. Whole herds of animals were apparently killed together, overcome by some common power. Interspersed in the muck depths and sometimes in the very piles of bones and tusks, tusks themselves are layers of volcanic ash. There is no doubt that coincidental with the end of the Pleistocene animals, at least in Alaska, there were violent volcanic eruptions of tremendous proportions. And then in addressing the matter of the frozen carcasses that were constantly turning up, he points out that it stands to reason that animals whose flesh is still preserved must have been killed and buried quickly to be preserved at all. Bodies that die and lie on the surface soon disintegrate and the bones are scattered. Throughout the Alaskan mucks, there is evidence of atmospheric disturbance of unparalleled violence. Mammoth and bison alike were torn and twisted as though by a cosmic hand in godly rage. In one place, we can find the foreleg and shoulder of a mammoth with portions of the flesh and the toenails and the hair still clinging to the blackened bones. Close by is the neck and skull of a bison with the vertebrae clinging together with tendons and ligaments of the chitinous covering of the horns intact. There is no mark of a knife or cutting implement. The animals were simply torn apart and scattered over the landscape like things of straw and string. Mixed with the piles of bones are trees, also twisted and torn and piled in tangled groups, and the whole is covered with the fine sifting muck, then frozen solid. 